reported today that most of the 18 schools identified had improved. Mr Blunkett said he was ready to do the same thing again. Robert Thompson and John Venables, who murdered toddler Jamie Bulger, were tonight offered a new hope of early release after the Home Secretary Jack Straw announced their sentences would be reviewed by ministers at the halfway stage. The Speaker of the House of Commons, Betty Boothroyd, has agreed to meet Sinn Féin MPs to discuss their demand for full use of Commons facilities. Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness were denied full access when they refused to swear allegiance to the Queen or to take their seats after the election. The Defence Secretary George Robertson has apologised to the Royal British Legion about the flag which flew outside the Defence Ministry during yesterday's remembrance service at the Cenotaph. The flag flew upside down and was full of holes. A replacement has been ordered. And the markets, the 100 share index closed up 43 points at 48.07, while in New York the Dow Jones fell 29 points to close at 7,552. The pound was down half a pfennig against the Deutschmark, closing at 2.89 marks. And on Wall Street, the pound closed down half a cent at $1.69. And tomorrow morning's front page is now, and of course there's no uh, dissent, certainly in these ones, about what the front page story is. Freed, says the mirror, but Louise can't come home. The Daily Mail says, mercy, freedom for Louise after Judge Quash's baby murder conviction. Smiling Louise Woodward, the time, come, said, the time had come, said the judge, to draw the drama of her trial to a close. Freedom, says the Express, mercy for Louise. Judge rules she has suffered enough. Moving on to the Telegraph, Louise Woodward is freed, and they say appear home by Christmas after the judge sows mercy. That's a quotation from somebody else. Moving on to the Independent, confusion, frustration, anger, but not murder. Confusion, frustration, and anger were certainly the words that Judge Zobo used today. And moving on to the Times, the front page of the Times, more about Bernie Eccleston. He certainly had to return more than 5,000. According to the Times, Labour ordered to return Grand Prix chiefs 1.5 million pounds, apparently donated to the Labour Party. And now we can leave you tonight with the latest pictures of Louise Woodward which come from Boston. That's all from us. I'll be back with more tomorrow night. Until then, good night. Will plans to celebrate the millennium be of any lasting benefit to Britain or just a waste of your money? On BBC Two in 45 minutes, join David Meller and his guests at the midnight hour. There's a brand new service throughout the night from 1.55 over on BBC One, up to the minute reports from around the globe with BBC News 24. If I was asked to describe my idea of heaven on earth, it would certainly be set in a country garden like this surrounded by a glorious jumble of colour and perfume. In his last series, Jeff Hamilton meets the people who have created their own versions of Heaven on Earth. Do you look upon this as your own little earthly paradise? Yes, it's got to be, hasn't it? Jeff Hamilton's Paradise Gardens, Friday at 8.30 on BBC Two. Now on BBC Two, an irreverent look at the modern world by and for the young at heart. It's Aldi TV. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Aldi TV. The programme that has always known what the fashion pundits have been telling us. Grey is definitely in this winter. Tonight I'm joined by regular oldie Richard Ingram, consumers champion Edward Enfield, and our old friend Marion Beaton. And we're also extremely privileged to be in the company of that grand old man of the bar, Roly Birkin, QC. Uh. Welcome, Roly. Uh. I, I don't know how you got into telly. Oh, it's actually right. <laughs> I mean, it's really like, I mean, it's like, it's like that, I mean, crash, right through a plate glass window. <laughs> ah, well, I guess I was a boy, yeah. I woke up, lights, camera, action, oh, boy. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, 
Naturally, I hear myself. I don't know. Improvise. <laughs> On to oldie of the week, Richard. Uh, well, I've selected a 75-year-old actor, Bob MacDonald, who was playing the part of a corpse in a Joe Orton play, directed by his wife. And uh, he, he kept falling asleep in the coffin on stage and snoring and disturbing the rest of the cast. So he was, his wife sacked him. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Edward? Well, yes, uh, on an earlier program I told this panel the most interesting fact that a hedgehog going at full speed goes as fast as a greyhound. And you all said, what rubbish, we don't believe you. I didn't. Well, now, I'm happy to say I've had a letter, a special hedgehog paper from a very nice lady of 76, who says, Dear Mr. Enfield, how could anybody not believe every word you say? I am amazed. I know a lot about hedgehogs, and I write in written support, though it shouldn't be necessary, by saying that hedgehogs certainly can run very fast, especially when dogs are after them. You will all think that's a forgery, but actually it's a perfectly genuine letter, and she is my only of the week. You let me read it, and it said, Dear Lovely. Yes, it, it, it did actually did say, it? dear, yeah. lovely, Mr. Edward Edward, Edward. I yeah. thought I'd suppress that bit, mm. but she's, yes, she is a great favourite of mine. Uh, I, of course, may be here to tell you, the Tibetan hedgehog travels 120 miles per hour, well documented. Tibetan? I uh, like that, <laughs> <laughs> I can pull it, <laughs> it's gone, <laughs> like a blur. <laughs> <laughs> Rowley, have you by any chance got an oldie of the week for us? But I did a little bit of research, I looked at this in many times, and I... Can't have any anyone here who'll know him. Mick Jagger. <laughs> I'm sad to say that Rolly Burke in QC has to leave us now, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> job, job. On tonight's Oldie TV, our token youngster, Paul Whitehouse, tells us why he finds oldies funny. We review the music video channel, MTV. And Jennifer Patterson goes to the seaside. Catchphrases used to be the most obtuse form of comedy, but there is one young comedian who has raised them to an art form. Responsible for Sutusa, brilliant, and cheesy peas, he began his career slithering around in a plastic bag on Rick Reeves' big night out, but is understandably better known for his work on Harry Enfield and Chums and now The Fast Show, which starts a new series this Friday. Sit down, Al, sit down. Don't mind whiskers. Just scoot her away. Oh, right. Oh, she likes you. Cats know about people, you know. Oh, did I tell you, Alf? My son's coming home from Australia in two weeks. Oh, right. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's you, Alf? Yes. Let's close in my private. <laughs> No. She's down south, isn't she? Yes. I'm giving you a piece of cake. Oh, no. He is Paul Whitehouse. <clears throat> and I must say, you're very brave coming on this programme. Well, I'm not frightened of you. Well, <laughs> Might be a them lot, but... <laughs> Why aren't you fighting at me, Paul? All right, I am. <clears throat> right, good. I like being described as young. It's a long time since Well, you I'm are describing. younger. Uh, younger, <laughs> right, OK. I, I do tend to come up with characters that require bald caps or, for example, a lot of ageing, and uh, it's, a, it's a kind of dull process. It usually takes about two hours, and I always forget when I'm writing a character, oh, I'm going to have to sit in... Uh, but, but uh, old people are funny, so I think it's worth the effort. Yeah, but we could we <laughs> could take offence, couldn't we? You could, but I think you're fair game. Look at you all sitting here banging on about how great you are every week. I mean, I think you... you <laughs> you're, up above, you're above the parapet, aren't you, you know? <clears throat> Do you actually always base your characters on somebody? Somebody that you've known, in a way? Like, say, Ro let's, let's go for the QC, man. Well, Rowley Birkin, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was uh, based on a very specific person that I met. When I, was fi I went fishing um, in Iceland, I'd brought a bottle of whiskey into this room and everyone brought some drink and he said, I, yes, I, yes, I, I, I'm a member of the Malt Whiskey Society in Edinburgh, <laughs> are you? And I was just going, well. And he went on to describe uh, how he tried to plug his wireless in but couldn't get... Actually, 
couldn't get any reception, and the only bit of the conversation I got was, <laughs> wireless. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I thought he's, a, he's a, a, quite a sort of cheeky character to do, mm. really, because, I mean, it was largely nonsense interspersed with the odd, you know, ridiculous phrase. Old people, generally, their ears get bigger, don't they? As you get <laughs> well, mine aren't bad now. For this sort of thing. Yeah, you're, but, yeah, you're I mean, coming on. Bad, yeah. You're coming on. Nice people are forty you're, something. You know, thirty yeah. something. Oh, yeah. sorry. <coughs> um, but uh, yeah, catch me in about thirty years' time if I'm still alive, and the ears will be, you know. So um, yes, we we had specially made ears for it, and a good uh, good old-fashioned drinker's nose. But he's enjoy he enjoys life. It's a life, Rowley Birkins, you know. And he, I think he's been a bit of an adventurer both with people and places. Or maybe it's all in his mind and, and, and the bottom of a glass. So what other people have you found then that you based your characters on? Well, um, Suit You, the irritating and uh, over-familiar tailors are based on a, a bloke who used to work at Hackney Council and a friend of mine there by the name of Danny Wiseman, who's a very good um, mimic. He used to, we used to t do this banter with each other and, he, and this fellow, once again, we didn't really have to do anything or create anything because he was there for us and he used to say, Hello, sir. Oh, we were out with a lady last night, sir. Oh, did she want it, sir? Oh. <laughs> and he was this vaguely sort of Uriah Heapish, <laughs> middle-aged man interested in uh, young people's sex lives and of course I'm becoming that now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite weird. As you approach middle age, you realise if I were to go out and buy a pair of leather trousers and a... Harley Davidson would be silly because I can't ride a motorbike. But if I did, <laughs> people would laugh and mock me for having my midlife crisis. But if one of you lot to do it, everyone would go, oh, what a character. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I, what, it is strange. Once you get slightly yeah. beyond middle age, then you can, you can make a fool of yourself to your heart's content and people think it's great. So, so I'm uh, looking forward to that. I was really. just going to say, you're looking forward to getting older now. Then, well, you? Middle age funny, is going to be a bit dull, is it? Well, probably. I, don't, I think you've... You know, Oh, no, I'll probably go the way of all the others and grow my hair long and buy a Harley Davidson. Just park it outside and shine it a lot. <laughs> who, who do you think influenced you in your, well, said very early on in your comedy? Um, well, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, definitely. And uh, Monty Python. Those people were definitely responsible for it. I'm not a, a proper comedian. I don't, you know, I never hankered a, after doing stand up and going and telling jokes for half an hour on stage in some dodgy old club. Uh, I had Harry do that for me, so he, he did all the <laughs> he did the hard Harry work, Enfield. the groundbreaking stuff, and I just <laughs> jumped on, gave him a couple of catchphrases, <laughs> did you, did you and then we benefited mutually. So. Do you, did you know Harry Enfield's father? Yeah, I bought a car off you, didn't I? Yes, Edward, I yeah. sold him a second-hand car. He's Correct. a good judge of character. He could see it once that I was a sort of chap to buy a second-hand car from. Absolutely, him. very reliable car. Mm, thank you. Mm. What I did you buy? It was a Nova, wasn't it? Yes, jolly good car. Yeah. Mm, you've still got it? No, I've moved on. <laughs> on and up. Peugeot 306. Mm -hmm. The dizzy heights of. Oh, yes. <laughs> I can tell you the real chink in Paul's armour. It's I discovered it from selling him a second-hand car mm. and filling in all the forms. I discovered his middle name. Mm. It's ah. something he's deeply ashamed of. Yeah. And I thought I'd say to him, look, watch it on this show. If you give me any trouble, I'll tell the six million people watching. It. I forgot it. And I, I've got all the researchers on this show <laughs> working to find out, and they can't, so your secret is actually safe. Oh, okay. tell us your no. name. No. I'll <laughs> no, I'm not telling you. Oh, come on, what's he begin no, with? I'm not going to tell you. Oh, please. No. <laughs> well, is it Welsh? No. Because you were no. born in Wales. No. He's deeply ashamed is of it. It is. Yeah. It's very embarrassing. Is it old fashioned, like Marmaduke? Or no, no, it's worse. Leave it, leave it, leave it. <laughs> leave it, he'll cry. Don't do it. Don't well, we will really... find out, you okay. know that, and we will right. announce it on the next programme. Do you mind? No, do what you want. Okay, well, Do what you want to me. <laughs> but then you must like, because it's the most wonderful thing in the world to make somebody laugh. And they like you for making them laugh, don't they? So you're getting well, your liking that way. <clears> I suppose I'd do it because it makes me laugh. I don't consciously think I'm going to go out and entertain a load of people. And so when that's put to me, it's quite nice. And in the way that I will watch Vic Reeves and uh, look forward to seeing Vic Reeves on the telly and derive a great deal of enjoyment from it, I don't, I never think, oh, people must be doing that about what I do. I suppose they do. Yeah. Well, yeah, they certainly do, but I do think it's very flattering to be, to, to make people laugh. And people are very grateful when you make them laugh. Don't you, aren't you grateful when people make you laugh, Richard? Come on, smile, Richard. <laughs> Well, that's it. Maybe so. I, I've been in the joke business for quite a long time myself. And, uh, 
<laughs> the I jokes he did. I absolutely agree with what Paul said about, because um, it's my own attitude, that you do it to make yourself laugh. And it, I always thought with, you know, with something like Private Eye, always did it so that I would have something to read. And I n never thought of the people out there yeah. reading it or laughing at it. It was, it's, it's absolutely right. You do it to, to amuse yourself. Mm. And that's, if you do it with that aim in mind and don't worry about your audience and what they might think or anything, that, then it'll be all right. I think it's absolutely true. Yeah, I think if you do, if you make a conscious effort to not do that, then I think that's when you're in trouble because then you're writing, you know, it yeah. actually becomes a, a, not a chore because, you know, you do absolutely have to put some work into mm. it. But uh, you, I think you're probably then in danger of just churning it yeah. out rather than doing what make, yeah. appeals to you. I remember reading something about somebody who lived opposite Charles Dickens. They looked across the street and they would see this man throwing himself back in the chair and laughing and <laughs> laughing. At his own <laughs> yes, as he, as he wrote that. Yeah. Yeah. Ten years ago, a new television channel was launched dedicated to the new device of the pop video. It was called MTV and featured short films of bands dressed in ill-fitting clothes, jigging around and occasionally turning into flies or covering each other up in washing up liquid or something equally ridiculous. Some have hailed the pop video as the ultimate art form of the late 20th century. Others have condemned MTV for promoting a three-minute attention span and for generally making a stupider society. MTV is 10 years old and our subject for tonight's review. Hello, it's Thursday, it's five o'clock and it's select time on MTV. Well, here we go then. I'm Camilla and this is Amor. Hello, welcome back. You could resist it and you, you just could not resist the fact that today is one day. Till then, whatever you do, do it hard. Betcha, Edward, I know what you think. Oh, it's awful. It, it, it's quite <laughs> terrible. And they told us that 140 million people watch that stuff, most of them age 10. You know that number of 10-year-olds in the world. It's poisoning their minds. It's absolutely disease. It's These awful poison. people making a frightful noise and uh, uh, oh, mouthing out rubbish in between <laughs> making a frightful noise. Quite awful. It Terrible. wasn't poisoning anybody's mind, honestly. I really don't know how you can say that about well, it. That's because you're out of touch with the world, maybe. But if you spoke to any primary school teacher, they would tell you that children are getting more difficult to teach, more difficult to control so that you can teach them. And one of the major influences is the poison pumped out by television and videos. And, and, and that's as poisonous as most things. Well, my son is a teacher and he doesn't say things like that. Uh, well, all the primary teachers in the Kingdom Bar One would say that without any doubt th this stuff is awful. I realised actually that as civilizations rise and fall, the coming one is going to be Afghanistan because uh, those Taliban chaps have got a very good idea. They, they smash all the television sets and they rip all the uh, tapes out of motor cars and they don't take drugs, they probably uh, sell them and they flog the people of their own who take them. And they're very tough. All they've got to do is sit still and the rest of the world will poison itself with drugs and muck like that. And then they'll think, well, they're so effete that we'll take over the whole place. And that's the coming empire, is the, is the Afghan, Afghan empire. This television poison, then, do you, you don't include yourself in that then? No, 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 this is a no. superior program, right. very, very <laughs> popular with Mrs. Mary Whitehouse, this program. <laughs> and, and, and that's why I have to right. keep laying these rules okay. down so she keeps on liking it. It seems program. to me that pop music is, is fairly basic and, and pretty uh, worthless as music. So a lot of clever men have dressed it up with these videos and very cleverly made and expensive videos. You can see that, there's a lot of, a lot of money and a lot of time has gone into making those videos to conceal the fact that the music is totally worthless. But you and Edward seem to have it in for anything that's not up, up your street. We don't, we don't. I mean, I, Go on, Mavis. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I have to tell you that looking at it, I wouldn't probably put it on much myself either, right? 
but I've watched it and I've looked at it and I haven't thought it was all that terrible. It does I have I just a think value. you're being snobby. Yes, and it has it, a and value. And the value is that it provides uh, employment for Dutch TV presenters. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, if only you get people to say, hey, and now there's some really good cool in music coming. OK, it's so cool. <laughs> So you don't agree with Noel Coward that cheap music is so potent? But it's not music, it's not music. If I you were in love, <laughs> every pop song has a meaning you never noticed in it before, you see. You, 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 notice that. you have to fall in love to appreciate pop music. If I fall in love, I like that rubbish. I yes, couldn't believe no. it, no, I just couldn't but believe that for a moment. Never, have you never <laughs> found something in your, you know, your heart, you two, <laughs> that <laughs> responds to a, Edward a, and I, to a Beatles, say? Eh? Edward you and sing, I. Ha, 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 I like the Beatles, yeah. Or whatever it's called. What's that Beatles? song you want to sing? Ha, 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 happy talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good little song you're for you, really, <laughs> You're really getting there, aren't you? <laughs> why, why, do you like, why do you like the Beatles? They did some very raucous and drunk I don't like the Beatles. I did like the Beatles. No, I've changed my mind. I don't like the Beatles anymore. If I'm getting any help oh, from you're Richard, I'm not. You know, in the space of a second. I like the Beatles. I don't like the Beatles. I'm so unused to getting an ally on this program that I don't want to lose. No, it, what it was down to is what Bill Dee's called this. What Edward and I have a feeling of cultural isolation. That there's something going on out there that we find is completely alien and, and it's not part. And we're 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 baffled and enraged. Yeah, well, I'm bewildered by it, current. Pop music. It means yeah, absolutely it? nothing to me. It is yeah. a legion of, you know, different types of dance music. It means nothing. But I don't say it's evil, poisonous, and not well, music. Well, I mean, Edward may have overstated <laughs> the case. But no, no, no I, I didn't overstate it a bit. It's aimed at turning all the ten-year-olds in Europe into morons. It's not. It's oh, not its specific on. aim. Do you think somebody I know? Yeah. I'm Let's going to create some music old. that's going to turn some ten-year-olds into morons. Yes, now. because then they're quite <laughs> morons. They listen to it. It's no, Dr. 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 Afghanistan can rise. Yes. yes uh, uh, I'd like it to be. I don't like think the Afghans have a hand in it. They're the beneficiaries. <laughs> oh, I bet they are. If yeah. you have grandchildren, Mavis, like I do, I have. Do you know that they come into your house, or mine do? They go straight to the telly, Steal or they put a video, and they sit there. Well, Whatever's on, and, and they're like zombies. Well, I'm terribly sorry to tell you, then, that you can't be a very appealing grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> because mine don't do that. We, we, I mean, mine will go and do that if, if I say, mm -hmm. Nan needs to go and cook now, and then they'll go to the telly and have a look. But otherwise, Nan and our grand, my grandchildren are going into their own fantasy worlds, not dissimilar from MTV, actually. <laughs> I mean, say not on. dissimilar to Edward Enfield's <laughs> no. fantasy world. There's something awfully Af funny Afghans about the morons. Nicholson family. They're different from everybody else. I don't know anybody like this. Everybody's grandchildren sit and stare at the telly if you give them half a chance, except the Nicholsons. They're the only ones that don't. What, what's your bet? Is it television that's bad or pop music? Or the combination of these two uh, evils? The whole thing for... No, but that, the Edward is bad. I mean, the fact is that, this, as, as we know, this, the, the standard of television has deteriorated very much so over the last few years. There's no question of that. Like I'll be off then. <laughs> no, but Paul is a shining light in the darkness. <laughs> but the, the general run of the bill programmes, called the BBC, if I may mention it on the BBC, is, 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 is very low compared to what it was. I mean, it's partly through lack of money. You could say, well, well this, this, this is the reason, or that, that's the reason. And, and perhaps the, the fact is that there's far too much of it going out. There are people desperately trying to fill every single hour of the day and night with some kind of television. If, if this show achieves a certain amount of viewers, the, the BBC will put it on. It's not a question oh. of whether they think it's any good or not. It's a question yeah. of how many people are going to but watch it. If that you yeah. all appeared naked and uh, you know offered a car as a prize, more people would watch. Oh my God! Mm. <laughs> no, what a would, horrible would thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, Edward is right too. I think he's in thinking that sooner or later, maybe not be the Taliban, but someone's going to come <laughs> along and say, all this must be abolished. Some fascist figure. And, uh, yeah, and so, uh, well, would it, well, but what is your position in it? Is you, are you with them? Or well, what? the trouble is, <laughs> oh, yeah, the trouble yeah. is, they're very keen, aren't they? I was just yeah. yeah. But the trouble is, we'd be at the mercy of spin doctors if we had some fascist thing. Therefore, we would be spun into idolatry of. Um, I think when, some the, when the Ayatollah came in in Iran, there were a whole lot of people in this country thought, including perhaps myself, thought well, this is a good thing. Mm. I had swept high away hopes of Singapore. That seemed to be a fascist dictatorship, and I was rather thinking of emigrating. But then all this fire started, and you can't breathe there anymore.
But I think they've probably got I'm an iron listening. grip on the press and the media over in Singapore. Am I listening to somebody serious or not? Excuse me asking you. Are they serious? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's, it's a fact of uh, history, maybe. They're where old. You have, where you have total permissiveness, you inevitably leads to some form of dictatorship or fascism. But we're not, per it's not that permissive any longer. Uh, a lot well, of things have changed that. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's not, be we're not very permissive now, are we? I can't even swear on television. No, I've not told you why. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you are, uh, are very aware of censorship in private eye, yeah. Mr. Ingrams. You get away with all sorts of filth. Mm. Well, we, um, yeah, we the F words appeared in private eye yeah. many times. But yeah, I, well, maybe, that's, maybe, that's part, maybe that's part of what I'm talking about. Maybe that's all. Well, well self-censorship is the only of real the... form of censorship. You should have done it then to yourself if you're so uh, worried about it. Uh, yes, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. So do you think there should be an oldie channel then? An oldie oh. TV channel? Yeah. Oh, no. I don't think so, no. I mean, I... It'd be very depressing. <laughs> well, I'm beginning to think there shouldn't be an oldie <laughs> TV. Confess, <laughs> 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 aside from that. <laughs> but watch out, it'll be stopped entirely sake. by young Let's people. Let's for goodness <laughs> sake move on. <laughs> Got an idea of really sprucing up the show. Got the young people. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Only those who brave the dangers of the sea can truly comprehend its mystery. And the same is true of Jennifer Patterson, a generous portion of the two fat ladies' double act. She agreed to brave the dangers of the seaside for us on oldie TV. The salty results are recorded here in Jennifer's diary. Dear diary, sometimes, really, the world seems so pleasant that one begins to forget that life is but a veil of tears. Happiness, in order to be fully appreciated, requires the occasional dose of hardship. So, dear diary, I thought it was time for a trip to the seaside. The great British seaside has never been able to compete with the Riviera. However, it has its own charms. I've always thought that sea bathing and sea air are splendid. Therapeutic treatments designed to make us appreciate the comforts of life. But look around. Lights, glamour, and more heart-stopping fairground rides one could ever hope for. But what could evoke the British seaside better than a windy walk on the pier? What I really want is a game of bagatelle. No duller way of spending money was ever devised. But what's all this? I'm dead. It's like being in hell, isn't it, in this sort of place? It's terrible noise. And all the children having their eardrums blasted. What has happened to the old seaside pursuits? This is meant to be fish. It's stuck in this horrible, this horrible little box when it should be a proper great big fish. At least we can put it in the proper receptacle in a piece of newspaper and get rid of that. Is there nothing left of my old England? Where are the three generations of family huddled round their thermos and their windbreak? What's happened to the tea dances? the plodding donkeys, and the variety show at the end of the pier. The seaside these days is all far too much fun. And so, dear diary, I shall not be rushing back to the seaside. It is no longer the domain of the tonic-seeking septuagenarian. It is the place for the young, shoot up doom bandits. Frankly, a day at the old-fashioned seaside has certainly gone to the dogs. Can you remember your earliest seaside memory? Yes, it was um, swimming in the Clyde estuary and coming out and getting rubbed down with butter to get all the oil off me. It's well, a wonder we're alive. We used to swim in the most... I won't describe it, Edward. You think so? <laughs> 
we used to swim in the most awful floating stuff and uh, covered in oil. You know, they go on about these seabirds and these disasters. We were just as covered in oil. Was <laughs> this in the war? Yes. yes. The boat was rationed. Memory. You couldn't go Margin rubbing no, yourself in it. I changed it to margarine. I just well, that was rationed too. Margarine. You couldn't go rubbing yourself. I don't believe this. It's my turn it to say. True. I don't believe it. How dare you, sir? Well, you I, don't make the rules of uh, truth in this it, program. It, it, yes, it's I was standing there head to foot <laughs> in yellow margarine with black streaks. You must have used the entire family's leg. ration for about a You're month. You're turning everybody on, I think. No, she, she would look like one of those people in those awful credits at the beginning of the program, <laughs> wouldn't you? Oh. Yes, <laughs> bathing cap <laughs> on. And, <laughs> and the crinkly costume. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think the seaside's gone to the dogs. Do you? Um, I go, I go to Brighton occasionally because I've got two small children. And I don't know if they like it, but I'm, I quite like playing Crusher Crab, <laughs> which I, I have no interest in these modern. Um, sorry, <laughs> they like you, Edward. Uh, these compu uh, computer games where you you know fly and take over a galaxy. But Crusher Crab is quite a basic human response. You know, it's an animal. It moves. You kill it. <laughs> and uh, these little crabs emerge from a shelter and you get to bash them with a mallet. It is a very satisfying game. <laughs> it sounds really good fun, yes. Mm. I like um, ducks and drakes, that's the great thing. The, mm. the only place you can play ducks and drakes is at the seaside. You know, you get a flat stone and spin it and it goes jump, jump, jump. You're very, in training and in practice, you probably get into double figures. And it's a very good sport. It's entirely innocent, it does no harm. Uh, it doesn't pollute the atmosphere, it gives you fresh air and exercise. It should really be an Olympic sport because um, there's no judging in it, uh, only counting the jumps. Well, there would be a lot of controversy, I'm sure, though. No, I think you know, some of those double skips. <laughs> <laughs> but I must say I agree with you. I think that the, the Drake thing is lovely. What's your highest score so far? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm a bit out of practice, but I think I could get into double figures, given mm. the right conditions and the right stone. It's quite nice to take a round knobbly stone and make it jump about once or twice. Um, uh, you know, just to be able to do it. You're, you're master of the stone. It is a joy when you find the right stone, isn't it? Oh, it's lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Yes. Treat, I could yeah. there's yeah. nothing more boring than doing that, <laughs> throwing stones into the sea. Well, it's, it's better than doing absolutely nothing, which is what we well, were talking about. Sit on the beach. You know, Get a man in to throw your stones. <laughs> 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 the temptation to do it yourself has spawned a thousand Sunday mornings spent in retail park superstores and a thousand Sunday afternoons spent dealing with the consequences in casualty. This English cult of do-it-yourself seems unstoppable, and it has Edward Enfield waxing wrath in this week's Gone to the Dogs. I'm thinking of starting a magazine called Don't Do It Yourself. It will mostly consist of interesting interviews from the hospital bedside of people who've cut off a limb with a chainsaw or electrocuted themselves with a power drill. I envisage an editorial column called Just Leave It Alone. This will not shrink from laying out the plain facts about DIY. Things like, no matter how carefully you measure it, it won't fit. And wallpaper paste is just a joke. There'll be a regular don't touch it feature. This will warn readers against amateur this or amateur that, magazines in which they may be cajoled into buying camera equipment suitable for a satellite reconnaissance work, or a computer slightly more powerful than the forces of darkness. A very popular feature will be the Tradesman of the Month. This will include such fine fellows as Bertie the Bricky, photographed with the smiling couple for whom he's built a garden wall. And this will go with a piece about their neighbour who did it himself and is in traction with a slipped disc. Very enjoyable will be Notes from the Fire Service, illustrated with smouldering ruins the work of amateur electricians. And there will be cautionary tales about people who flooded their houses by changing their own radiators instead of going to a plumber. Anyone who tells you that plumbing is easy is lying. Anyone who tells you it's fun should be reported to the authorities. If plumbing is done properly, it's neither easy or fun, just expensive. All the features combine to convey the powerful message of the magazine, which is that the role of the amateur is to cut grass, walk dogs, race pigeons, collect stamps, and sit still, but not to do honest tradesmen out of a decent living by botching up their own homes. Edward, methinks you do protest too much. I suspect you of not being any good at all at D DIY. It bears out the truth of uh, Hilaire Belloc's little rhyme about Lord Finchley, who tried to, who mend the electric light and was electrocuted. And the moral was, it is the duty, to, no, it is the business of the wealthy man to give employment to the artisan.
That's what Edward is saying. And that he's makes you feel slightly inadequate. It's like challenge your masculinity, doesn't it? If you can't, you know, do a bit of plumbing and a, I mean, I can do a little bit of plastering. A little bit. Of so I kind of re try and retain my masculinity in that way. But um, <laughs> no, it, is, it is a challenge, isn't it? You know, you can't, I can't do any wiring or plumbing or anything like that. So I'm, I'm with you on that one, actually. <laughs> Get a man in. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> What's wrong with doing it yourself, though, really? You don't really mean that. You mean you don't like doing it yourself. I don't like doing it myself. I do like honest tradesmen earning an honest living. Mm -hmm. And I quite agree. You have to build up a, a, a sort of select acquaintance so that you've got a good plumber and a good electrician and a good bricklayer and a good plasterer. And uh, then you're all right. And you must pay them promptly. That's the other thing that's very important. <coughs> to, you've got to pay their bills promptly. And cash. <laughs> <laughs> you were a plasterer, weren't you, in real life? Yeah, I was for a while, yeah. Mm. I wasn't bad. Um, I did a couple of dodgy jobs, but um, on the whole, you do, you know, you, do, you try and do your best. A couple of rough ones, though. Do you like In it? fact, it once was described, I have to use a rude word again. Uh, somebody did describe some bit of plastering, I don't know, well, it's as rough as a badger's arse. Mm. <laughs> I don't know how he had knowledge of badges arse, isn't he? <laughs> There's nothing sexier, I don't think, than, um, than chaps doing work around the house, I have to say. <laughs> Sexist uh, remark, though. We object in to what way? Well, I think that the Black and Decker... Or the man in Black and Decker. With his... <laughs> Which setting? <laughs> hammer or...? No, mm -hmm. they the screwing, sorry. <laughs> screwing in, Edward? screws into How could she shells. get away with screwing if <laughs> I can't get away with screwing? I think it's wonderful. I think they're absolutely <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> These are all bonkers. There's Paul saying it, something that challenges your masculinity or some such rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and you're saying it's sexy. Mm. It's utter rubbish. It's just putting a screw in the wall. There's nothing either sexy or challenging. I, know, but it, I think the body looks rather good doing yeah. it. I'm, I'm, I'm speakers I find. I'm sorry, Edward. Well, we like well, the sight of, of women doing the washing up. <laughs> well, okay, that's fine. That's good. fine. I'm glad you're allowed to say that. Mm. There are very good reasons for not employing <laughs> tradesmen in your house. They wouldn't be safe. <laughs> Couldn't turn their back on you for a minute. Why does sex come into all these discussions? It's supposed to be about painting and decorating. <laughs> It was Sophia Loren who said, I like my wrinkles, I've earned every one of them. But an increasing number of oldies are unhappy with their wrinkles, and the beauty business is always ready to offer new ways of holding back the years. MC Beaton took a ride on the bandwagon for us. In my youth, Father William, I used to think of age as a plateau, where I could give up trying to be glamorous and let it all hang out. No more diets, no more sweating under the hairdryer, no more fiddling with lip gloss. But now I've arrived, I can't even enjoy being a slob because I'm nagged on all sides by photos of glamorous oldies, plastic surgery and yuck makeovers. As we used to say in the gobbles, you'll fall souffre your detre beau. But is it necessary at my age to suffer to be beautiful? Why is there still the pressure to have the face and figure of someone half your age? Or is it good to be glamorous and put a bit of glitter back into your life? I'm going to find out. In my search for glamour, I've decided to check in at this hotel. It's where all the top models stay, you know. Wow, would you look at that? I bet she might have some tips for me. Are you a model? Well, I was some 25 years ago, yes. What? I mean, may I ask you how old you are? Indeed. I'll be 50. So you know, you do forget once you're over 50, but I think I'm 57 in January. Oh, my God. There's <laughs> hope. There's hope. Is it plastic surgery? Oh, a, li a little bit of cheating here and there. Uh-huh. You know, just a little bit of uh, refreshment, shall we say. Are you saying that old isn't beautiful, then? No, not at all, Marion. I, I mean, I do believe there's beauty in every age, in every age group. But I think that, uh, why, why not? Well, you know, why not? If we, can, if we can look good, why not? Let's do it. You know, why, why throw the towel in? You mean if you've got it? If you've got it, flaunt it. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. Exactly. laughs> the face is right now, but I've got to do something about the clothes. This is hardly the cardigan of a glamorous woman.
the truth is that I just don't know where to begin changing my style. Now, this little red number, for example, at my age, one slice of apple pie and it would cut off my circulation. What do you think I should wear? I think you've got to get rid of the coat. Right? Yeah. yeah. Even though it's warm, I don't think it's not doing yes. much for you. Very animal Making... hospital. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Makes you look frumpy. Ralph Harris. Yeah. What kind of shoes should I wear? Definitely high heels. Really Highest. high? Yes. Stilettos, platforms, anything. That's really big. big. Yeah, but shouldn't a woman be small? No, tall, tall. Very tall. Tall is very in. The ultimate glamorous escapism is to pretend to be a model for the day. I've been promised a full makeover to unleash the beautiful new me all within a few hours. Oh, this should do the trick. Bring your left shoulder down and bring that chin round. That's it. Slap the industrial strength Vaseline on your lens, Miss Photographer. I'm here to buck the system. Smile. <laughs> well. Oh, my evening dress is falling off. It's like housework, you know, you do it one day, you've got to do it all over again. And it's a bit like this, this. It took an hour to get this far. What's the point if it's only for a day? I think I found a solution I prefer. A spot of beauty sleep. Good night. Well, I think you look lovely now. <laughs> don't you think we do look better, all of us, anyway? Well, I don't know. If you look at people as I do in, in the London Underground, you think what a terribly drab lot we are. Yeah. Everyone's wearing sort of dark clothes, and they look pretty miserable, I think. Of course, a lot of them are foreigners, tourists. But um, they're all very drab, and they're all wearing dark clothes, and looking miserable. Well, I don't know. Where am I going? Well, why do I come to London and think everybody looks okey-doke? And why do you oh, they come look to London? In Wales, they must have <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to MC Beaton, Richard Ingrams, Edward Enfield, and our special guest, Paul Whitehouse. We'll be back at the same time next week. If you're still alive, good night. completely up the spout as well means that although I can see where after the bell maybe previously on the bill you mustn't tell a soul I'm getting tired of your empty threats Kerry oh this one's far from empty David Kent